Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is uh, Nick Sherman, and I'm the head of strategy at Game Insight. And uh, I also lead um, the whole esports initiative in the company. So, uh, you know, we've spent already some time uh, working on esports. Uh, we've learned many lessons uh, at first hand, and I'm really happy to share this experience today with you. So, but, you know, talking about esports regarding Game Insight, of course, uh, I'm talking about Guns of Boom, our leading product, uh, which, uh, so it's a first person shooter, you could see it from the, you know, this video introduction, and um, it was launched May 2017, so like a year and a half ago and uh, has already guarded a uh, really huge audience, more than 55 million downloads, uh, active daily users number is more than a million, and uh, they play average uh, 15 to 20 million battles a day. So there is a huge you know, potential for uh, many things, including esports, and that's what we are working on now. The game was also nominated for uh, different um, awards and was awarded by some of them. Uh, it has a huge uh, communities on different social networks. So yes, and it's, uh, as I said, it's a fruitful soil to work with. Uh, but the thing is, um, when we just started working on Guns of Boom, we never thought about making it an esports. So our first big goal was to create uh, the best mobile shooter, first-person shooter. And that was the challenging goal, because, uh, you know, shooter, first-person shooter and mobile has, uh, you know, some complicated uh, puzzles to get solved. So, and... I think that we've kind of uh, redefined the whole genre for the mobiles because, you know, f to play first-person shooter, a real first-person shooter, not PUBG style of games, you need uh, simultaneously doing three things: to move your character, to aim your weapon, and to shoot. So at least three buttons. But uh, playing mobile, you have just two th fingers to, you know, get control. So the solution, in our case, was to get rid of one of the elements, of the control elements, and uh, we came up with uh, auto-fire. So you don't need to push button to fire. Once uh, your weapon is aimed exactly on your enemy, uh, auto-fire started. So that's, I would say, lead to the whole success because of uh, this uh, control solution and because of the whole, uh, I would say, funny way the game was produced, this cartoonish style. Uh, uh, you know, besides of that, by the way, we still have problems with uh, the platforms because, you know, it's, it's not actually the best time to have, for example, word gun in the name of the game because of all the shootings uh, every once in a while happens in the US. Uh, the guys, uh, instead of, you know, working on the real problems, decided to, I would say, you know, blame somebody or someone or something. And uh, video games is a really, you know, nice example. So, yeah, it's uh, also a problem to, to, to work with. But still, we've never thought about uh, esports. But once the game became popular, once millions of players uh, started to join the battles, they inevitably came to us and asked to organize some kind of tournaments to let them compete with each other on some I mean, new level. And uh, I can say that esports was something we haven't heard about before. But of course, it was not the area of our expertise. And uh, we sat down to, you know, to discuss how to deal with it, and uh, not 
you know, manage to find the, all the answers to all the questions. We decided to approach a friend of ours, uh, eSports Holding eSports, uh, which owned that time uh, a couple of biggest names uh, in traditional eSports world, Navi and uh, Virtus Pro. And from the very first meeting, we understood that uh, we talk in the same lang language, and uh, the guys had uh, completely the same thoughts as we had, and uh, that gave us an opportunity to find common goals, common interests, and to work very tightly on uh, creating all you know stuff that followed. So we also realized how many challenges we are going to face on our way to success here. First of all, and the main headache to deal with was the basic concept of the game, because Guns of Boom is a free-to-play game, which means that uh, uh, besides you know, uh, working on your skills, you can take an advantage um, through buying some stuff and uh, to buy kind of superiority. Um, and uh, it doesn't work in esports world because uh, pay to win situation and esports cannot coexist under one roof. So um, we had to find a solution. But besides that, there were many other challenges, uh, for example, community challenge. Uh, you know, mobile gamers are not hardcore ones. I mean, of course they could, you know, play every once in a while some kind of hardcore games, but uh, in general meaning, they are just, you know, guys who want to kill time, not, you know, uh, making plans of going to some offline tournaments uh, to different places. And they have, they have their normal life, uh, their jobs, their families, and uh, esports is not their professional kind of interest. So uh, we needed to find a way how to make these people who used to play single get organized in teams and uh, play in groups. Uh, we also had to find a solution of how to make game not only interesting to play, but interesting to watch. Because esports, first of all, is something uh, to show for other people, not just to play yourself. So it, you know, it might be watchable. Uh, the product also, you know, had to go through many changes. Uh, but again, we couldn't break the basic model, the free-to-play model, because uh, the game generates much revenue, and uh, we you know, didn't want to kill the business. We just wanted to develop it. Um, so yeah, many challenges, many open questions, many things to think about. So that's everything we always like. Um, but the first question to deal with and uh, to begin with, the biggest question was for what reason? Why we need to dive into this you know, unexplored uh, ocean of esports, something we don't know a lot about, and why we need to spend our resources, money, time, everything on that. Our first guess was my money. I mean, something obvious. Maybe we thought we could you know, make uh, some extra bucks out of it. But the answer is no, you cannot. Uh, of course, you need money, but for you know, otherwise uh, purpose to spend it on your esports initiatives, not to earn it from it. Uh, but besides this, you know, bunch of uh, competitive-oriented guys who wanted their tournaments, there are really a lot of high-level users who had played uh, for a long time who spent some bucks on it, who started to get bored, and they need some new goals. They need some ultimate goal. They need, uh, I mean, they need something to 
um, look up and uh, to, to, to achieve to. And uh, they all actually really uh, enjoyed esports. Then, of course, marketing, because esports generates so much content you can use in, in, different, in different ways. And uh, first of all, it's the great opportunity to show your product in action, to sell your product in action, which is probably the best way of selling anything. And of course, with all this content published in social networks, uh, it worked great for um, increasing your brand awareness, as we learned later. And ultimately, of course, all the players who you know uh, received a new goal, something uh, you know postponed, uh, something to to reach, they start playing more. They start. Uh, uh, spent more time in the game, they start uh, buying new weapons, and uh, it all um, leads to, you know, longer lifetime, higher LTV, and ultimately more money. That's where money is here, for us at least, and at least at this moment. <sighs> Forget about money. Um, yeah. But again, after considering all this stuff, we realized that we need somebody with um, ready-to-use infrastructure to uh, help us to put our plans into reality. And that's how I met Ralph Reihardt, who is the CEO of ESL. ESL is a Germany-based uh, company, probably the largest esports holding in the world. Uh, it's, I would say, more media company. And uh, on our first meeting, I just put a phone with uh, launched Guns of Boom into Ralph's hand and uh, said, this is our mobile game, which, as we think, has a great potential in mobile esports. Please try it. And the guy had played it for the whole meeting, I mean, like half an hour, and I immediately realized that uh, this is the right person to talk to, and uh, this is the right place to be, and uh, our partnership was kind of inevitable after that. So, of course, it cost us, I mean, um, Many, many meetings with the ASL team, uh, countless conference calls, internal discussions, hours uh, spent on, uh, you know, thinking of, can we do this, should we do that, and everything. But we ended up with our inaugural season, eSports season, for Guns of Boom, which uh, took start uh, early June this year. And it started with uh, online Go4 tournaments on ESL platform, uh, where teams can uh, earn their qualification points. And uh, those who collect the most of them could go through qualifiers to offline events. And there are two of them this season. The first one is in, uh, was in uh, Katowice, Poland, uh, late June, uh, July. Sorry, and uh, yeah, Katowice is not uh, an accident. I mean, uh, ESL has uh, their studio there, and Kat Katowice in Poland now is a kind of uh, capital of European esports, where they held uh, one of the biggest tournaments, Intel Extreme Masters, every February. Great event. I really recommend just to go and uh, to witness it. Uh, and the second one is going to happen. Uh, mid-November on ESL Studios uh, in LA. And it's going to be, the first one was European Invitational, so we invited only European-based uh, teams. And uh, the second one is going to be kind of grand finals, global finals. Now we are in the middle of the season. And uh, yeah, it was, I mean, it, it all sounds great, but there were much work to be done before coming to the action. 
First of all, we had to deal with the product. We had so much work to do. Um, this competitive mode I was talking about uh, eventually had uh, this name, ProPlay Mode. And uh, we came up with this solution. So we decided that only players with 22nd layer or, uh, level or higher could uh, enter the ProPlay Mode. First of all, we wanted players to get some experience before going uh, pro. And uh, second, we've decided to equalize all the stuff, all the weapons um, inside the ProPlay Mode on 62nd level to make everybody more or less uh, equal. So the next huge thing we've developed was uh, this unique technical integration. And uh, it's really unique. I mean, nobody but us has this kind of integration with ESL. It works this way. So uh, first of all, you need to apply for a tournament on ESL's website. After that, um, 10 minutes before the tournament, you get notified uh, by the game that the tournament is going to begin in two minutes. 10, 10 minutes, sorry. And uh, after that, whatever you are doing in the game, you are pulled in into the tournament without pushing any buttons. I mean, not a single tap. You just start you know, playing uh, the tournament with your team. Spectator mode, which is the crucial part, as I said before, uh, and we've even produced this uh, specific AR mode um, spectators mode for uh, broadcasters and uh, video bloggers to let them show the game from these observer's points of view, which works really great. You can see it on the picture. And uh, of course, in-game promo, because uh, you need you know, to make Esports visible for the players to let them uh, enter and try the thing. The show components. We also spent much time um, trying to understand how it should look like. The, actually, the most problem with mobile esports as a whole thing now is that nobody knows how it should look like. Everybody knows. Uh, kind of is traditional esports uh, character traditional esports player the guy in uh, you know this uh, branded uh, t-shirt full of different badges with sponsors uh, sitting uh, on a fancy chair with uh, these uh, you know super expensive uh, computers razer computers or hyperx computers and stuff like uh, mouses and uh, mouse pods and everything but nobody knows how uh, mobile esports should look like should players uh, stay or sit or lay down i don't know and nobody knows uh, should they be in a cozy studio with uh, sofas or sitting on, in a bar or, I don't know, you know, walking around and play, playing uh, on, <laughs> on their walking? So nobody knows. And we are still uh, working on that. We still don't know the ultimate answer. But uh, we've got some ideas. So and uh, maybe later we will find to some ultimate solution. And uh, there was also much work with uh, platforms, with community, PR, social media, everything. So eSports is about content, how to produce it, and how to distribute it. That's it. And despite uh, our eSports season uh, far, to going to an end, uh, so it's still not over. But we already have something to be proud of. And one, for example, of the latest uh, latest news about uh, our esports initiatives is that uh, one of the teams uh, which played qualified for uh, European Invitational were acquired by a professional esports organization, Forza and uh, played uh, this European Invitational under the new brand, under the new, new name, and uh, they kind of, you know, uh, grew up to the next level. Uh, 
and we really expect uh, similar events to happen more and more later on. Um, but I think that the most important thing is that we've managed to grow this number of competitive oriented, oriented uh, players and uh, we've learned that these players are as twice more active as uh, regular play players, which, you know, makes sense uh, and uh, explains everything. So, and we will work on, uh, you know, growing this number later. <coughs> so that's basically it. Thank you for come in again, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm really happy to answer it. Thank you, Nick. If there's some questions, yeah, we'll probably want to get a... Is there a roving mic? We can uh, get down to... Uh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Oh yeah, there's someone over there. There's loads of questions. Don't worry. Yeah, there's there's loads. We'll we'll get around to everyone. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, hello, I have a bit of a design question. When you mentioned uh, first developing Guns of Boom, you started by automating the firing, um, the you know, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. implementing auto fire. I wanted to ask you in terms of uh, balancing aim assist for esports. So, uh, did you? Um, I imagine you're still probably working on that during live ops and so on. But uh, did you do extensive A/B testing, or were you following like the established patterns from like console developers? Was it was it a different pipeline in getting that right from, for example, what you would expect in console shooters and esports titles? Uh, well, uh, of course, it was an important part of the whole work. And uh, did I get your right that you want to understand how we built the, uh, in the yes, process? Yes, how you I am very curious to discover yeah, so how you actually build your firing mechanics, and especially when it comes to aim assist. Did you have like some, for example, data modeling during internal tests? Ah, okay. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it, I mean, it, it's uh, it has nothing to do with esports. I mean, it, it's about the, the auto fire uh, mechanic. I mean, as a whole. Uh, yes, but that's kind of essential for e FPS. Yeah, it's kind of essential, but uh, when everybody are equal, it doesn't matter. I mean, if everybody has this auto fire, I mean, that explains everything. You don't need to, you know, to, to imagine mm. something. But we've also thought about making some um, special maps, for example, for snipers, where you should, you know, uh, excellent your sniper skills because uh, it's a little bit different than just playing with a uh, regular weapon. Uh, but uh, speaking of uh, general autofire thing, uh, yes, it was, I mean, really great work. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's a theme for a, a different discussion. Okay. So, thank you. Don't worry, we'll, we'll make our way around the room. And we've actually put plenty of time aside for questions, so we'll get around to everyone, don't worry. <laughs> All right, hello. Uh, so how have you structured your, your team, especially the community management uh, around the esports? Do you have like a team handling this or somebody who is like specialized in esports? What kind of roles do you need to make this happen? Yeah, very good question. Thank you very much. So uh, we had to you know, to find these answers uh, <laughs> with our experience. Because uh, at the very early beginning, there were nobody who understands esports and who um, got involved in it. So I was the first person in the company who started this initiative. Then um, it turned out that we have a number of people who just uh, themselves are uh, competitive players uh, and who play the different, I mean, different hardcore games, PC play, uh, PC games, like um, League of Legends, like Dota 2, like everything. So, and they knew a lot about how um, the, um, this environment work and how, um, I, I would say, how to and how and where find questions, uh, find answers to the questions uh, we were um, actually 
I'm busy with. And uh, incidentally, for example, the head of community in the company, uh, she is uh, a woman, she uh, turned out to be one of them. And uh, that's uh, helped us, you know, to solve many problems, actually, because she works really um, hard and tight with, with uh, the community stuff, with uh, everybody involved into the um, community kind of things. So uh, that was great, because uh, she really helps us to build this, uh, you know, uh, communication with the audience. And she learned us how to, ta taught us how to, you know, how to make them uh, get involved into the uh, stuff. So that was really great. And uh, besides that, uh, we found this, you know, couple more persons who were really interested in uh, uh, in the initiative. So and it was we didn't hire new people. We just, you know, uh, <laughs> understood who wants to, to be a part of it inside the company. All right, thank you very much. We've got some questions over this side as well. Thank you. Then we'll come down the front. Hi, Nick. I have two questions too. Uh, one is, uh, what do you think about streaming of your uh, game? Uh, is it going to be like a classical streaming? Do you have already assigned streamers or broadcasters? And a second question is, uh, how are you building your strategy regarding the classical uh, esports tournaments? I mean, like, are you going to have like online leagues, LAN finals, uh, other BO2 or BO3 systems? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, yes, streamers actually is a crucial part for any esports and any action kind of game, I would say, in competitive game. And uh, what we started with uh, was, uh, it was a before esports, we started working with uh, different influencers uh, and streamers uh, all over the world. But uh, I will tell you these numbers. We, we've probably paid for around a hundred videos, and then uh, in a year, we ended up with more than 100,000 videos published on YouTube uh, from just regular players, not uh, you know any kind of uh, paid uh, uh, partners. So and now, uh, once I mean esports became so. Um, important for us. Of course, uh, we put it on a kind of a new level, and uh, now we work with uh, influencers and uh, different organizations. Uh, even not, not uh, on our own, but through ESL also. Uh, they have, uh, I mean, huge connectivity with the different kind of guys. So, and they help us a lot. And uh, regarding your second question of about um, uh, the structure strategy, yes. So we we are already working on our next season, and uh, of course uh, our intention is to put it also on the next level and to do something we've uh, never done before. And for example, we don't have any organized league so far, and uh, of course we are thinking about it. Uh, we are thinking about. Um, um, about league uh, divided by regions, uh, six, as I remember, regions. I mean, like South America, North America, Europe, Asia. Uh, and uh, we are thinking about yeah, different stuff. But again, mobile esports can't. We, of course, we should uh, learn, uh, learn lessons from the traditional esports. We should take the best out from it. But we cannot just, you know, uh, take this legacy and uh, implement it into the mobile. We should uh, invent something new. We should uh, define it. So we are thinking about different stuff, uh, and I would be happy to tell, tell about it maybe next year. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. You, you mentioned retention as the, the main goal or the main... One of the main goals. One of the main goals or the outcome. So uh, did you see retention improve only with like the most engaged competitive players or all, for the, all, all the players? Uh, of course. Uh, first of all, uh, it's all about these competitive players. and. 
and the main goal now is to grow the number of these competitive players. But as it works with all the, I mean, in all the other uh, community-based uh, products, once the core audience, uh, you know, uh, goes to the next level, all the others, all the others uh, will follow. So that's our thought. Hello. Uh, have you uh, thought about uh, other partners other than ESL, or do you plan uh, like uh, support uh, other uh, platforms, say, uh, platforms, or uh, smaller or other services? Yeah. Thank you very much for this question. Actually, uh, I forgot to mention EGL, which is uh, England, England uh, Games League or something. Uh, so, and we've started uh, with them. Our first tournaments um, uh, been organized by EGL. It was before uh, our ESL um, partnership. Uh, and we still work with EGL for some, you know, uh, local events and some smaller, um, smaller events. Uh, but before building the whole infrastructure and the whole uh, um, thing, we, uh, we thought about whether it should be kind of open kind of st uh, stuff, like, uh, for example, um, uh, Steam does, where everybody could uh, organize any kind of tournament for Counter-Strike or Dota 2 or something. Uh, or it should be a uh, closed environment, like League of Legends, for example. Or it can be a mixed one, where we can do some you know, closed events, but at the same time to let others to connect our uh, platform and uh, organize their own events. Uh, for now, it looks like we have a mixed one. Uh, because uh, we work with uh, ESL as uh, the main partner, but we still have some smaller partners to organize some uh, local events. Uh, and what I think is that we will keep it uh, this way. Maybe later we will even implement some kind of API to let, uh, to, to, I mean, to, to, to make it even easier. So, yeah. We had some other question from the front, I think. Were you ready to yep. go? Yeah. Oh, the, the mic's coming from you. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you kind of touched upon it briefly in like the previous answers, but one of them was like at what point in the game's life cycle did you decide it was ready to try something like esports? And then, uh, yeah, which you were briefly just talking about them, but how did you kind of mitigate the risk in the first instance without going straight into like a $200,000 tournament? What did you do on like a low level to make sure that it would work before going like full on into a big league? Can you please specify a little bit? I didn't get it. Yeah, so basically, how did you, instead of just going for like a full league uh, and doing something really big to kick things off, which uh, obviously has got quite a, quite a lot of risk attached to it, did you run like any sort of smaller tests first oh, yeah. or anything like that? And how did you go about doing that? Yeah, of course. So, as I mentioned, uh, we've started with EGL, uh, and it was a very small tournament uh, with prize pool like 20 pounds or something like that. I mean, very small. And uh, we've tested it uh, there in the UK, uh, locally. Uh, it was, I would say, yeah, it was a number of events, not, not just one. So, and after that, uh, we moved to this um, Go4 uh, thing with ESL. And uh, in Go4 tournaments, for example, um, weekly prize is like $1,000 uh, uh, for the winner, for the team. Not for the one person, but for the team. Uh, so yeah, 200,000 is uh, for the whole season and uh, basically for these two offline events, uh, two finals. The first one was um, European Invitational with price pool, total uh, price pool around, uh, how many much was that, like 60,000 or something like that. And um, the grand final will have 120,000. So 120 out of 200, so it's, you know, the, the, the huge part of it. So it's, it's more about, uh, you know, this offline presence than uh, about online tournaments. Right, thank you. We have a question from the front. Yeah. Uh, 
we actually still have a few, uh, a few minutes left before our next speaker joins us. Just a couple of minutes. Maybe we've got time for another question. Um, oh, this, well, we, when we get a couple in, we've got some... Uh, very eager. Uh, so, yeah, if we're, if we're efficient, we can get two more in, have uh, thanks for the talk. If a player sees a tournament and decides to download the game because he seemed it on the esports scene, how long does it take him to get to the pro play mode? So to reach this 20 second level, if you play really intense, uh, it will take you about a month, I would say. A month. Why is it earlier? Um, sorry. Uh, why isn't it earlier? Why did you decide to, uh, to time it for like a month play? What, what was the reason? What were your reasons? Okay, can you speak a little bit louder? What were your reasons to actually wait one month for a player to unlock ah, okay. the pro game? Yeah, yeah. So um, the main reason is uh, to make a person uh, get some experience uh, to play the, in professional mode. And uh, the other reason is. Uh, I mean, it's a business side. Uh, we, we want him to spend some money. <laughs> <laughs> That's refreshingly honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can be frank with you. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, do you know what? We, have, we probably have time for just one more question. Was that both of your questions? Yeah. Yeah, we have probably one, one more time from uh, one over here, and then, uh, and then we'll maybe have to wrap it up. Uh, hi. Uh, so, does the problem mode somehow differ from the basic game besides not being pay to win? So, is the balance different? Or? Uh, Yes, of course. It's balanced a little bit different. I can't go into details here because I'm not so much oriented on the, you know, game um, play. But yes, a little bit different. 